Today we're out here taking a look at the vehicle that is jokingly referred to as the Fiat. This is the Fiat 124 Spider, and it's the sister to the Mazda MX-5 Miata. Let's get the 800 pound gorilla out of the way right up front. The Fiat 124 Spider is made by Mazda in a Mazda factory in Japan. Fiat supplies the styling to the vehicle and the engine under the hood, but Mazda supplies the vast majority of what you're seeing right here. Mazda's MX-5 is so much fun to drive because its history really can be traced back to lightweight British and Italian sports cars styled very much like the 124 Spyder that we're looking at right here. Because that is really the history of the MX-5 and why it exists, it makes perfect sense to use the MX-5 as the basis for the 124 Spyder. The front end of the 124 Spyder was designed to give a little bit of homage to 124s of the past, but also to stay current with the rest of Fiat's lineup in the world. We have halogen headlamps, fog lamps right down here, and turn signals between. When you get right up to the front of this vehicle, it should be obvious how small of a car this actually is, because the MX-5 and the 124 Spyder are some of the smallest cars sold in the United States. In terms of overall length, the 124 Spider is about 5 inches longer than the MX-5 Miata. And a lot of that difference goes right back here to the trunk, because we actually have a slightly larger trunk, and right up there to the front bumper. The change is not just styling, but also cooling, because we get a turbocharged engine under this hood, not a naturally aspirated engine, so there did have to be room for an intercooler. And of course, adding extra length to the front of the vehicle helps give the 124 Spider this very classic Roadster look, with the long hood and the short body behind. Out back, we find parking sensors in this particular trim. The third stoplight is mounted right here to the trunk lid, and we get a slight spoiler effect to the top right there. We have oval tail lamps and twin exhaust tips on most models. If you get the Abarth trim, then we get four exhaust tips. Under the hood of the 124 Spider, we find just one engine in the United States. It's a 1.4 liter turbocharged four-cylinder engine producing either 160 horsepower or 164 horsepower and 184 pound-feet of torque. This engine is lifted from vehicles like the Fiat 500X, the Fiat 500 Abarth, and even the Jeep Renegade. Sending power to the rear wheels is a standard six-speed manual transmission, which interestingly enough is not the same transmission that you find in the current generation Mazda MX-5. It's actually the manual transmission from the previous generation Mazda. The turbocharged engine is one of the big defining characteristics of the Fiat version of this vehicle, because the Mazda MX-5 produces a little less power, 155, but it produces that power 500 RPM higher in the RPM range. Torque in the Mazda engine comes in at 148, which is a decent difference between this at 184, and the torque happens 2100 RPM higher in the Mazda. It means we get a great deal more low-end torque from this engine, although we do get a little bit of turbo lag. When it comes to front seat comfort, the important thing to remember is that this is a small car. This front seat is moved all the way back in its tracks, and this is just about right for me at six feet tall. I actually might want this seat to be just a little bit further back if it could. That means that if you're over my height, you may have troubles getting in the MX-5 and finding a comfortable driving position. The other thing to keep in mind is that if you're much smaller than me, you may also have troubles finding an ideal driving position because this seat does not adjust for height. Now, if you slide the seat forward in its tracks, it does become a little bit higher off the ground, but that's just because the seat rails are at sort of an angle, so that way it gets a little bit higher off the ground as you slide towards the front. But the seat bottom cushion does not move up and down independently. That's to help save weight. Another weight-saving touch is that we have a steering column that tilts but does not telescope. At 4.9 cubic feet, you will find a little bit more cargo room right back here than you'll find in the MX-5, but not that much more although this is still more than you'll find in some convertibles out there. The cargo room in the back does not change whether you have the top up or down because the top does not actually go back there into the cargo area. It actually descends into its own compartment between the rear seats and the trunk. In terms of bag capacity, I was able to fit two 22-inch roller bags right back here, but only one of our 24-inch roller bags like we usually test with. Obviously, we can't give this a very high trunk comfort index as a result of the limited storage capacity. However, many convertibles out there will have less storage space than this when the top is down. And again, this has the same space top down or top up. On the inside of the cabin, we find fixed headrests and rollover protection. On the driver's side, we find small perforations because there are speakers built into this headrest that are used for both the Bluetooth system and the audio system. Between the front seats is where we find the glove compartment, not on the driver's side. And there is a surprising amount of room in here for things like the removable cup holders in this car, we can also store things like small tablet computers or our Fiat instruction manual. Over on the front doors, we find soft touch plastics on the upper portion of the door and this midsection right here, along with a soft touch armrest, and then hard plastics lower on the door. What's perhaps most interesting about the soft touch plastics that we find on this front door is that the 124 Spider 
is very light. This actually does not weigh that much different than the Alpha 4C Spider, which is an ultra lightweight carbon fiber vehicle. Hard plastics generally weigh less than soft touch plastics, and that's why we see such a Spartan cabin inside the Alpha, but inside this vehicle, we actually see soft touch materials, yet we still see a very, very lightweight vehicle. As we move from the doors to the dashboard, we find more of that same soft touch material, and this is another area where this is a little bit different than the MX-5. We find a few more soft touch parts in this cabin that feel a little bit more premium than what we find in the MX-5. In the center of the dashboard, we find the same infotainment system that we see in the MX-5. This is one of Mazda's systems. It does feature available navigation, and a nice touch with this one is that you can add navigation from the dealer for relatively little. You notice that our particular model does not have it, so we just get this compass display. We have a single air vent right here in the middle, and then we have round air vents on either side of the cabin. Moving down from there, we have the engine start-stop button and the controls for the single-zone climate control system, as well as our heated seats right over there. A small storage cubby where you can just barely put an iPhone 7 Plus, USB and auxiliary input, and then we have a fairly typical console shifter. We press this button right on top, pull back for drive, manual mode is over to the left, we pull towards the driver for up, and push away from the driver for down. In most 124 models, this is how you will manually control the automatic transmission if you do select that option, because most models do not get shift paddles on the back of the steering wheel. We have our handbrake right over there to the right of that, and then working our way down, we have the controls for the infotainment and navigation system. Again, very much the same that we find in certain Mazda models. We have a navigation button, home button, direct access to the media button, a favorites button, back button. This is our volume and power knob. And then this is a multi-way directional toggle. It moves side to side, up and down, rotates around and clicks to enter. Between the front seats, we find another storage cubby. This is quite small. I was not able to fit a cell phone in there or a wallet. You can pretty much just put keys change that sort of thing right there. If you're an American and you're wondering where the cup holder is, fear not, that's what these two interesting little rectangles are for. We have that removable cup holder that was in the glove compartment. We simply snap it right into that slot and then another one goes right here for the driver's cup holder. Now these are in an awkward position to be perfectly honest, right here behind the seats. And that's why we find another cup holder slot over on the passenger side. You snap that right into there, and then you can put your drink right over here in a more convenient place for the driver. Now, unfortunately, it is going to be very close to the passenger's left knee. The instrument cluster is designed around this large central tachometer. We have the speedometer over here on the right, and the multifunction display on the left. The multifunction display is fairly basic. It gives us a digital exterior temperature and our trip computer readouts. The steering wheel is a three-spoke design, very similar to what we see in the Mazda Miata. On the left side, we have our infotainment controls, and on the right side, we have our cruise controls. You'll find phone buttons over here on the infotainment side of the steering wheel, as well as an info button to change that multifunction display's readout. In our acceleration test, we ran from 0 to 60 in 6.3 seconds. That's essentially the same time as the MX-5 Miata. You might be wondering how that's possible, since we have a little bit more power under the hood, a decent amount more torque under the hood, and all of it arrives at much lower RPMs than the MX-5. The big reason, of course, is that this vehicle is a little bit heavier than the MX-5. In addition to that, this vehicle also has essentially the same automatic transmission as the MX-5 Miata. And this automatic transmission's gear ratios were not really designed with a turbocharged engine in mind. That's why in the manual transmission of Fiat 124 Spider, it actually gets the previous generation Mazda MX-5's manual transmission, not the current one, because those gear ratios are a little bit more appropriate for a turbocharged engine. Although most drivers will likely be faster 0 to 60 in the automatic equipped 124 Spider, I would actually take the 6 speed manual transmission because it just suits the character of this vehicle a little bit better. It's an awful lot of fun, and thanks to the low end torque that we find out of this turbocharged engine, it's actually easier to drive as a daily driver than the MX-5 Miata. With the MX-5, you have to rev the engine pretty high in order to get the maximum amount of oomph out of it, and you don't have to do that with this particular engine. In fact, I can put this in the manual mode, I can floor it, lug the engine right here around 2,000 RPM, and we're getting acceleration. That's because of the turbocharged engine and the very broad horsepower and torque curve that it gives this small engine. Likely thanks to the added curb weight, it took us 112 feet to stop from 60 miles an hour back to zero. When it comes to handling, this vehicle easily scores an A-. You might be wondering why it's not an A or an A+. The reason for that is that this vehicle, like most roadsters of its type, are not really about absolute lateral grip. If you want more grip than this, you will find it in certain other convertibles out there. But those convertibles are not going to be as communicative, they're not going to be as much fun, they're not going to be as light and flickable as this vehicle. This is one of the most fun vehicles that I've driven this year, and it's also an incredible value when you consider the amount of fun you can have for the price tag of the vehicle. 
Out on gravel roads, the different suspension tune in the 124 Spider is a little bit more obvious because this feels a little bit more relaxed than the Mazda MX-5 Miata. The suspension does a slightly better job of soaking up larger imperfections on the road, and smaller imperfections definitely don't transmit themselves into the cabin in the same way that we find in the Mazda. Back out here on paved roads, the slightly softer suspension that we find in the 124 Spider doesn't really have that big of an impact on handling because the Mazda MX-5 and therefore this 124 Spider, they've never really been ultra hardcore hard suspension kind of vehicles. They don't need to be because of the light curb weight. When you start removing weight from a vehicle, you don't need to make the suspension as firm or have the tires be as large or everything be as heavy duty in order to have the same kind of handling ability. The more weight you pull out of a vehicle, the better it's going to handle, the faster it's going to accelerate, and the shorter it's going to stop. And that's exactly what we see in the 124 Spider. At 75 decibels at 50 miles an hour with the top in place, this is one of the louder vehicles that we have tested. However, we do get a slightly quieter cabin than you'll find in the MX-5 because all of the 124 models get a standard double layer top. The double layer top helps reduce the interior noise by about one decibel, and that may not sound like a lot, but it is noticeable. Thanks to the lightweight design of this vehicle, even though we've been driving it pretty hard over a week and about 500 miles of mixed driving, we have been averaging 28 miles per gallon, which is an excellent fuel economy score. Turbocharged engines tend to score very well in EPA fuel economy tests, but obviously, the more you use the turbo, the more fuel it's going to consume, the lower your fuel economy is going to get. In all honesty, the 124 Spider comes across as Miata perfected, and I'm not exactly sure whether Fiat or Mazda for that matter would really like me describing this vehicle in that way, but it's the best way that I can describe the way this feels out on the road, because it takes everything that I like about the Miata and adds a turbocharged engine, which is something that I have always thought the Miata needed. Now, a lot of Miata purists out there may say that they don't like the idea of a Miata with a turbocharged engine, and to them I say, that's exactly why I'm happy that the 124 Spider exists, because this allows the Miata purists to still have a pure Miata without a turbocharged engine, and it allows shoppers that want a Miata with a turbocharged engine to have a vehicle that they can buy. The turbocharged engine makes this vehicle easier to commute with, especially if you have this equipped with a manual transmission, because it means you can stay in those taller gears longer without downshifting. And a lot of up and downshifting is really why people seem to dislike having manual transmission vehicles for their daily commuter. This really does help that equation. If I were shopping for a vehicle in this segment, this is exactly the car that I would get, and I would probably get it in this Lusso trim, I would put stickier tires on it, I would get an engine computer upgrade, and I would get the manual transmission. For 2017, the base Classica trim will start at $24,995. That's with the six-speed manual transmission. As you'd expect out of a vehicle in this category, all trims of the 124 Spider start out with the manual transmission, then you can add the automatic transmission for $1,350. Importantly, in the base model, we do not get the wider tires that we find in the Lusso trim that we have been driving or in the Abarth trim. We also don't find the 7-inch LCD in the dashboard standard. That is an option in the base trim. Instead, we get a very small 3-inch LCD. I suspect most shoppers will want to step up into the Lusso trim, which is what we have been driving this week. It starts at $27,495. Again, the automatic transmission is optional, but that adds a lot of the things that people will really want. Heated leather front seats, that 7-inch infotainment screen, which you can also add navigation to, the automatic climate control, rain sense wipers, etc. The Abarth trim is the most expensive trim of the 124 Spider. It's also the one that gives you a little bit more power, and it causes the torque to happen at lower RPMs than in the Lusso or the Classica trim. So although that number doesn't actually change, it occurs just a little bit lower. The sport exhaust, the sport seats, the sport suspension, and the limited slip differential are all standard, but if you want to get the Brembo brake package, that's an extra $1,495 that's not included in the base model. If you were to add all of the available factory options to your 124 Spider, it'll top out right around $37,000. With a price range of between approximately $25,000 and $37,000, there isn't much direct competition for the 124 Spider other than Mazda's MX-5. There are, of course, other roadsters out there, something like a BMW Z4, and there are other economical coupes out there, like Toyota's 86, but neither one is the same thing as the MX-5 or the Fiat 124 Spider. And that's why when I attended the launch event last year for the Fiat 124 Spider, they provided some very unusual competition. They had a Volkswagen Beetle convertible, and they also had a Mini Cooper convertible, neither one of which is really a direct cross shop to the 124 Spider in my mind. 
The 124 Spider has a great deal going for it. As I said earlier, I do really think of it as Miata perfected because we have that slightly softer suspension. It's a little bit easier to live with. It's also a little bit easier to commute with if you choose the manual transmission option thanks to the turbocharged engine. It's easier to add more power to it if you want to do an ECU engine computer upgrade to it or if you want to swap out the turbo later and spend a little bit more money it's a lot easier to get more power out of the 124 Spider than out of an MX-5 for the same dollar. I also appreciate the subtle interior tweaks. Again, not too much has changed from the MX-5 in terms of interior. However, the 124 Spider does have some slightly nicer touches inside and out. On the downside from that, the 124 Spider may cost you just a little bit more than a comparably equipped MX-5. We're only talking a few hundred dollars here, so it's not really that big of a deal. However, you do have to give up a few things that we do find in the MX-5, like the LED headlamps. Of course, in compensation for that, we do get the roomier trunk and the slightly nicer interior parts. My only major complaint is that the Abarth trim doesn't get a more significant power bump. 4 horsepower is nice, but 40 horsepower would be even more fun. I would really love to see a factory 200 horsepower tune of the Fiat 124 Spider. Now the logical reason that they didn't do that is because they were afraid that it might step on the Alfa Romeo 4C's toes just a little bit too closely. Let's start out our comparison section by talking about the MX-5. It starts at 24,915, so very much the same range as the 124 Spider. Mazda and Fiat have been very upfront that the MX-5 and the 124 Spider share a great deal. Obviously, the Fiat 124 Spider would not have existed without the MX-5. However, you might be surprised to hear that the MX-5 would not exist without the Fiat 124 Spider either. Because Mazda was seriously considering killing off the Mazda MX-5 program because it just doesn't make that much money for Mazda. It's a very low volume model. They make a lot of mainstream cars, a lot of cars that sell in higher volume and make them more money. But the MX-5 was so central to Mazda's personality and Mazda's mission that they felt they had to keep making it. And that's exactly why Mazda and Fiat banded together to help keep the MX-5 alive. Obviously, the Fiat 124 Spider is based very heavily on the MX-5. There are a great deal of parts shared with it, but the big reason that it exists is because, of course, Fiat helped with the development costs of the MX-5. Choosing between the MX-5 and the Fiat 124 Spider is kind of like choosing between two twins. In some ways, they're identical twins, and in some ways, they're more of a fraternal pair. I've always liked the MX-5, but as I said earlier, there are a few things that I would have tweaked if I could have, and a number of those have been addressed with the 124 Spyder, with that slightly softer suspension, and yet again, the turbocharged engine. Next up, we have the Toyota 86. You might know this as the Scion FRS. Now that the Scion brand is dead in the United States, they've rebadged it, the Toyota 86, which is, interestingly enough, the name it has been sold in other world markets since it launched. Of course, the Toyota 86 is also known as the Subaru BRZ because the 86, the BRZ, and the FRS are all the same vehicle. Just like Fiat and Mazda got together to build a two-door Roadster, Toyota and Subaru got together to build a two-door four-seat coupe. At $26,255, the 86 starts higher than the 124 Spider, and most importantly, of course, it's not a convertible. Although the Toyota has more power under the hood, its four-cylinder boxer engine produces its power at much higher RPMs than the 124 Spider's engine. It's also about 400 pounds heavier than the 124 Spider, and as a result, you end up with the same 0 to 60 time, although for some reason the 86 really feels more winded. It really feels like you have to rev the nuts off of that engine to get it to do anything. You get a slightly different feel in the 124 Spider. But of course, the biggest difference between the two vehicles is that they're just not the same kind of vehicle. The 86 is a four-seat, two-door coupe. The 124 Spyder is a two-seat Roadster convertible. That means that in many ways, the BMW Z4 is actually a closer competitor to the 124 Spyder. Although you could actually buy two Fiat 124 Spyders for the same price as one BMW Z4 in its base trim. But yet again, the Z4 is not the same kind of animal, not just because of the price tag, but also because of the feel. As I said before, you can get to good performance by removing weight from the vehicle, you can get to good handling by removing weight from the vehicle, or you can go a different route. And the Z4 is the different route because we have wider tires on the vehicle. The wider tires required heavier duty suspension components and bigger brakes and a different body to help minimize chassis flex. And that of course meant we needed more power and then a bigger engine and then all those luxury touches, etc. So the BMW Z4 is significantly heavier than the 124 Spider. How much heavier? We're talking a full thousand pounds heavier than the 124 Spider. That's an increase of about 40%. 
The Z4 is going to give you much better acceleration. It's also going to give you a ton of luxury options that you just can't get on the 124 Spider, but it's not going to feel as direct or as raw as the 124. Next up in our one of these things is not like the other comparison. We have Fiat's own 500C Abarth. The 500C is the almost convertible Fiat. What they basically do is they put an enormous canvas top on the vehicle with a rear window that descends down into the trunk. The 500C Abarth trim actually uses basically the same engine that we find in the 124 Spider, although they have been modified for one to sit across the engine bay in the 500C and longitudinally in the 124 Spider. Although the engines are essentially the same, the 500C uses a 5-speed manual transmission instead of a 6-speed manual transmission, and it's about 100 pounds heavier than the 124 Spider, and that's why the 500C Abarth is slower 0 to 60. On the other hand, the 500 is more practical. It may have small rear seats, but they do exist, and you don't find them in the 124 Spider. The seats also have more adjustment to them than we find in the 124. Of course, there's a big trade-off from that, because instead of being a very nimble, lightweight, rear-wheel drive roadster, it's a fairly nimble front-wheel drive hot hatch, and it's just not the same kind of thing out on the road. As you might have expected, the Fiat 124 Spider is my pick in this very small segment, and if you start including some of these other options that don't really compete, but I've included here anyway, I would take the 124 Spider over them as well. The rear seats in the Toyota 86 and the Subaru BRZ are so small that they're practically useless. The ones in the 500C are a little bit larger, but they're definitely not comfortable. So I would actually say that the rear seats are not that big of a selling point for me. If you're looking for something that's more of a weekend car or a fun car, then those back seats aren't really going to be too material. If you're looking for a daily commuter that's also very fun to drive, the 124 Spider simply blows the 500C out of the water. Same thing with the Subaru BRZ or the Scion FRS. The ability to use the 124 Spider as a daily commute vehicle is one of the reasons that I choose it over the MX-5. The turbocharged engine is really the reason here. Because if I were to buy the MX-5 or the 124 Spider, I'd want the six-speed manual transmission. And I've done a long daily commute in stop-and-go traffic with a manual transmission in a variety of different vehicles, and turbocharged ones are just a little bit easier to live with. Because you can lug the engine in that gear a little bit longer, you get that low-end torque, so you can leave it in second gear and slow and go traffic. You don't have to keep shifting through the gears. It just makes things just a little bit easier. And of course, it is definitely the value alternative to the BMW Z4 because you could literally buy two or three Fiat 124 Spiders for the price of a BMW Z4, depending on how you've configured the BMW. Thanks for taking the time to check out this video. Again, I'm Alex Steinks, and this has been the 124 Spider. Be sure and check out those related videos on the bottom of your screen. You can also hit that button to subscribe to this channel. Find us over at patreon.com if you want to support us, and find us over at facebook.com so you can see what we're driving this week. I'll see you next week.